let's start today's lecture with some notes on the band structure. Band structure is the relationship between energy and the k vector of an electron. K vector is a uh, one of the numbers, quantum numbers that help us to describe the state of an electron. We know from previous lectures that for each k vector, for each k number, we can find an energy. And actually, for many of those k vectors, we can find infinite many energies, infinite many solutions, we know, uh, which are then occupied based on the number of electrons in the system. This is the same principle as when we are talking about uh, isolated atom. We also know that there exist ranges of energies for which we cannot find any k vector. And these would be so-called gaps between energy bands. So if I look at such a very, you can see what you share, oh, sorry. Um, so if you look at a diagram like this, we would see that for all those energies in this range, we can find for each of them a k vector, sometimes even more k vectors that correspond to this energy. The same thing for all those energies, right? So if I look just at the energy level in these energy ranges, we find corresponding k vectors. However, if we look into this range, we do not find any corresponding k vectors for those energies. And those are then filling the gap between bands of energies. This is where all of this terminology, the band structure comes from, where the band gap comes from and where the uh, calculation of electronic bands come from. We also know from previous lectures, how do these bands appear? When we started from the free electron models, we didn't have any bands. We had just a dispersion relationship where for each energy, we were able to find a K vector simply because the energy was proportional to the K vector squared. When we went from the other side in the tight binding model, we then started from isolated energy levels, which corresponding to, corresponded to isolated atoms. And as we put the atoms together, the electrons started seeing the neighboring atoms. These energy bands started splitting into two, three, four, and at the end of the day, infinite many levels, which are quasi discrete, so they fill in a whole range of energy levels. Nevertheless, within this energy range, I have infinite many levels. And this is what I then call the energy band. So let us now uh, try to describe or discuss what are the similarities between the nearly free electrons model and the tight binding methods. I've already told you that those are eventually approaches that come to the same reality, but they start from very different pictures. The nearly free electrons once again start from the picture when an electron does not see any crystalline structure at all. It does not see any atoms at all. It does not interact, it is free. And we introduce the interaction with atoms, with the crystal lattice, we introduce this by a small perturbation delta u. That led, <clears throat> that led to a solution that we showed here two weeks ago in which the free electron band as described by this line here, when crossing the Brillouin zone boundary and therefore crossing another free electron band coming from the neighboring uh, Brillouin zone boundary. At this point, this doubly degenerate point 
split and in the first approximation it splits by the uh, delta u which is the measure of how strong this potential is how this interaction is so at the end of the day when we start or when we uh, switch on the interaction between electrons of the crystalline potential described by the Fourier components of this uh, lattice periodic potential, we see that at the point where the two free electron bands would be crossing, where E1k equals E2k in this uh, free electron description, we then get the splitting by this plus minus sign, which leads to eventually an energy separation. We can have a look at the um, shapes of those bands, both near to the center of the brilliant zone at the gamma point, as well as near to the top of the first band at the brilliant zone boundary. From those descriptions, we would end up with the dependence, which is uh, proportional to the k squared. Obviously, near to the gamma point, we have the free electron dispersion like, which is quadratic in terms of the k vector, near to the brilliant zone boundary, we get inverse parabola. That means, again, the shape here is proportional to the k squared. The constant of proportionality would be then negative. What do we get from the tight binding method? The dispersion relationship that we have derived last week looked something like this, in which we had the single ionization energy, single electron energies, epsilon j. We had there the uh, hoping integrals, the uh, integrals that corresponded to the uh, interaction of a state on one atom and the same state on another atom, and the interaction was mediated by the uh, interatomic potential, so by the fact that there are actually any atoms, by the fact that we have this, uh, uh, this periodic potential. If we assume that the potential is weak, then the interaction between those two orbitals can be realized, the overlap is non-zero, only for nearest neighbors. This r equal to zero leads to this integral beta here, which is eventually uh, j zero delta u j zero. So it's the interaction of an atom on the same uh, on the same state, uh, so on, on the same atom. Uh, the integrals t a equal eventually to the integral j zero and then we move to an atom which is positioned by the a vector apart from our origin from the atom where uh, we center our test orbit so in the case of weak potential only those two orbitals only those two integrals are significantly non-zero and so we can simplify the whole time binding uh, band structure to only this one expression. Excuse me, to this one expression, right? So we are simplifying it from the fact that we would have here a sum over uh, all r vectors, t r e minus uh, i k r over all lattice vectors, right? So only uh, the nearest neighbor integrals are equal to c uh, are, are non-zero. When we would do Taylor expansion of the cosine function at the 
uh, gamma point or near to the grain boundary, uh, grain boundary, excuse me, near to the uh, brilliant zone boundary. That means at the K equal roughly uh, pi over A. Uh, then we uh, would find out that the cosine function, which is a, a constant plus x squared, uh, one half, right? Roughly something like this, minus the higher order terms of the Taylor expansion, which are the fourth order and fifth uh, and sixth order polynomials. So if we end our expansion after the quadratic uh, quadratic term of this expansion, we end up again with a parabolic dispersion, parabolic dependence of the energy on the k vector. Also near to the grain boundary, once again, near to the Brulein zone boundary, uh, the k vector dependence would be inverse parabola. So when we sum this up, both methods provide the same qualitative description. They tell us that the minima of the bands, and here we showed it at the uh, for the case of uh, essentially one uh, one band uh, description or the lowest band lying description. We showed that the minimum of this lowest lying band is at the gamma point for k equals zero. The maximum is uh, obtained at the Brulein zone boundary, which is uh, at the k vector equal pi over a. And that near both of these extrema, both near to the minimum and maximum, we can very well approximate the shapes by the parabolic shape. This will become important later on today. There was the first note on the bed structure. We now continue with realizing that HK is not a momentum. We have used this before in our free electron description where we were trying to describe or link the velocity to the K vector. And we eventually said the velocity is momentum over mass, which is HK over mass. Right. And we then use this later on also to saying what is, for example, the kinetic energy as one half mv squared, we then said is one half h bar squared uh, k squared over m. Now, uh, in fact, if you realize what do we have in the Hamiltonian when we are solving our Schrodinger equation? We do not have there such a term for the kinetic energy. We have there one half h bar over m. And then we have there um, the Gradient squared. So we have the uh, Nabla operator squared there. Mm -hmm. So this is the kinetic energy operator. What we are now saying is that uh, we have to use indeed the operator form here instead of simply putting their k squared, because this is not a kinetic energy of a general state. This is a free and a, sorry, this is a kinetic energy of a very special state, which is not a general blocks state. Let's have a look at this. What we have here is that for the momentum, we have employed the operator I H uh, omega, uh, I, uh, I A nabla. So then when we come to this, uh, was a continuum or was a classical uh, formulae when we say the kinetic energy is uh, one half p e squared over m. We would just place this part in there and get that it is one half 
h bar. Okay, I'm missing a sign there because there should be probably a minus minus somewhere. Probably here. So then we have h bar squared i squared over m nabla squared. And I should still be missing the, uh, the minus sign here because the minus that I've just added will not help me really here. So probably I'm missing the minus somewhere in here as well in the kinetic energy. Probably not, no, there I will not miss it. So good. When we now try to put in or calculate what is the momentum of a general block's state, remind ourselves what is a block state. Block state is a function which is described as a product of a plane wave and a lattice periodic function. So when we cal try to calculate now the momentum corresponding to this block state, it means we calculate what is the result of momentum operator acting on this state. What do we get? Well, we have the uh, operator, which is minus I H nabla. And then we have the psi we should have the k here as well, right? Now, what is this? So we put in there the blocks function, ihkr times ukr. And I missed here the number of right. So when I calculate now a derivative of a product, I have to use the their part is rule. So I derive, uh, calculate the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function. So I get here, so this is minus i h. And the derivative of the first function is again i h bar. Oh, sorry, it's not h bar anymore. i k. times a i k r times u k r. So this is the derivative of the first function plus now I need to calculate also the derivative of the second part, which is minus a uh, i h bar a i k r gradient u k r. All right. If I look at the first part that I have here in red color, I get that this is h bar k e i k r u k r. And in this form, I realized that this is my blocks function psi kr. But I have here also plus term minus i h by h bar e a k r nabla u k r. Right. So if h car h bar k was a momentum, then the corresponding function must be an eigenstate of this operator. That means that I need to get the p operator acting on this function equals 
h bar k, this is the eigenvalue times the same function. And this I get only in the case when the second term diminishes, and that diminishes only when this derivative of the uh, lattice periodic function is equal to zero. This derivative of the second uh, of this function, this lattice periodic function to be equal to zero means that the function needs to be a constant. In other words, I end up with a function which is not a plane wave times a lattice periodic function, but it's just a plane wave times some constant. And this is indeed my free electron solution. So if you now would rewind back and come back to the point where we discussed what is this h bar h bar k uh, when we used it as a uh, approximation or estimation of the velocity momentum therefore velocity we use this for free electrons but for free electrons this is fine for free electrons it works because there the eigenstates are just plane waves and plane waves are eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. In that case, h bar k is the eigenvalue, is therefore representing a value of the momentum. In general case, however, this is not the case. So here we have the same derivative uh, derivation that we have just done. So uh, please be careful about using the value h bar k as an estimation of the momentum of an electron. This is true only in the free electron case, or it is a reasonable approximation when you have extremely weak atomic potential, when you can really uh, speak about nearly free electrons. Instead, when we think about the Bloch's function, an electron will be a superposition of many plane waves. And therefore, we can define the velocity with which the electron moves in a spa space as a group velocity of this set. The group velocity is defined as the change of the frequency with respect to the k vector. And when we now substitute what this frequency would mean for us, we end up with the uh, definition that a velocity is obtained as a gradient of the uh, energy dispersion curve normalized by h bar. And this is extremely important uh, result it provides you with some relationship between a kinetic properties of electrons or the states corresponding to electrons and the band structure itself. So the band structure indeed describes the dynamically moving electrons as well. We will now use this uh, relation to derive so-called effective masses. We would like to describe an electron in a similar manner as we did for our uh, classical particles. However, now we are facing the problem that an electron is not a particle. We already know that we can link its velocity with the band structure, but we would like now to know how we can link the force that acts on an electron with its velocity, with its changes. How can we really apply uh, the sort of classical dynamics to, to an electron in a potential? So let us start with uh, 
re re remembering us, how do we calculate a work which is done by a force on a body? We define this as the force times the path on which this, this, uh, this force acted. This gives us the, for, the, the work being done by this force. And now this path, if we have a body which moves, and in this case, the body is an electron, which moves with a velocity V, then this is done, the path delta S is equal to V times delta T. And V is the velocity of an electron. We now come from the point that we know the energetics of our electronic system because we know the band structure. And therefore we can say that if an external force acts on an electron and it does some work, this work, which is an energy, cannot be just lost. This energy, this work must be reflected by the change of the energy of the electron. And so we relate this work to an energy change of an electron. And since energy is given by a K vector, which is sort of the index labeling the state of an electron, if an electron changes its energy state, it means it changes its k vector, changes the uh, right. It changes its uh, state as described by the k vector. So we can also relate this change of the energy to the change of the k vector when we know how the energy changes with respect to the k vector. But from the previous slide, we know that this is where the definition of the group velocity equal uh, to the h bar times the velocity, the group velocity of an electron. So that's how we end up with this relation between the work and the work from here. We know is force times velocity times dt. Um, how we relate this to actually the change in the uh, with the k vector. We cancel out the velocities, we end up finally with an equation that describes the time evolution of the k vector with respect to, uh, to the uh, or as a result of the acting force. So the equation of motion, the equivalence of the classical second Newton's law is now given by this, this one. We do not describe the positions of an electron. We describe the result of acting force as a change of the K vector, which describes the state of an electron. Nonetheless, we would love to find an equivalence between this equation of state and this, uh, sorry, equation of motion and our classical second Newton's law. Just love it. The second Newton's law describes uh, the relationship between the force and acceleration. Specifically, it says that the force, once again, is equal to m times a, where m is the mass of a particle, a is the acceleration. So acceleration is force over mass. If we now define a quantum mechanical analog of the acceleration, once again, as the rate of change of the velocity, we can use all the relations that we had from the previous uh, from the previous slides, in which we said that velocity was one over h bar times uh, the, the 
E over DK. And so now we would not need to find the relationship also between the um, change of the DK with respect to DT, um, which was one over H bar was equal to M. And when we put all of those relations together, we put it in this equation, we eventually end up with the relationship between the acceleration that we have defined and a force. And when we now look at the equivalent classical formula from the second Newton's law, we would say that whatever is left here in front is actually the, or should correspond in the classical picture to the inverse mass. And this leads us to a definition of a mass of an electron or more specifically to an effective mass of an electron, which is the, in analogy to the second Newton's law, this is the constant of proportionality between the acceleration and the force. Once again, from here, we say that this is equal to one over mass because it is an analogy. We label it with a star to signify this fact that this is an effective mass. And therefore we get that the mass is inversely proportional to the curvature of the energy band. And this will be once again, very, very important in the later discussion. <clears throat> we have already mentioned that uh, in, the, in the first point that we were making here, that near to extrema, both nearly free electron model as well as the tight binding model lead to a decent approximation of the energy bands as parabolic relationships uh, or functions of the k-vector. If we have a parabolic dispersion relationship, that means the mass, effective mass, which comes as a curvature, will become a constant. And since we have this inverse relationship between the curvature and the effective mass, we immediately see that the more curved bands, bands which are more steeper in one or the other way, have higher curvature, they lead to a mass that is uh, smaller. We have broader bands, the corresponding mass is larger because the curvature is smaller. We also see from what I have just drawn that we might get effective masses which are positive as well as effective masses which are negative. This is something which is contraintuitive in the context of the classical uh, second Newton's law where all bodies, classical bodies have just positive mass. We will see immediately that this uh, possibility for expressing some quasi-particles as particles with negative mass has a huge consequences for explaining some physical phenomena. So let us have a look at the holes. What are holes? Consider a full band full band of electrons, that means all those states are occupied. Because of the symmetry of the system, the sum of the full band, that means sum over all occupied states, when I sum over the k vectors, I get zero. The now consider a situation where one electron is excited into the conduction band. It means I have a band which is almost full. It is a band which contains 
infinite many states, but one. It is difficult to describe that you are having almost all electrons in the band. It is much easier to say which one is missing. It is difficult for me to describe all those of you who are present here at the lecture. It is much easier to point at the one or two individuals who are not here. And this is the principle of holes as missing electrons. So if you want to describe this almost full band, band with one missing electron, that means when we now try to sum up over all states that are present in the band, we end up with a sum over all bands minus the one missing electron, which is labeled with an index E. And from above, from the symmetry, we know that this is equal to zero. So this almost full band sums up, the sum over all K vectors sums up to minus the vector, the, uh, the wave vector of the missing electron. And we will label this missing uh, K vector minus KE. We will label this with a value corresponding to the, to the whole. So the whole is that K vector of the same magnitude of the missing electron, but opposite oriented. We now explore other properties of the, of the holes. So first of all, the energy of a hole. Since we are describing the missing electrons, we assign to a hole the same energy as would have the missing electron. So we want to say that our system the energy of a system with many electrons, but one with missing, is essentially, how to best describe this, uh, the energy is an energy of all individual electrons up to the one missing electron. And we would like now to say that this is essentially the sum over of the whole band. So this is where the electron was still present, minus, uh, sorry, plus the energy of the whole. And the energy of the whole, we know this is the energy of the minus electron. So there should be J, K, J. Uh, here we have a plus energy of the minus K, E. And by definition, we now say that this is the energy of the uh, missing electron. It should be missing. So we, we need to put here the minus sign to get to the correct energies. So the minus sign here in this definition comes from the requirement that the energy of a hole describes the energy of a missing electron. Since the holes are, again, equivalents of the, of the electrons in the same sense that we are now describing instead of the occupied state, the kind of unoccupied states or empty states, we can uh, use the same 
ideas, the same formalism we have developed before. And from the known band structure of holes, can now assign also a velocity to the hole in accordance or in equivalence to the way how we did it for the electrons. There we said that the VE is one over H bar gradient of the electronic band structure. And from the uh, minus signs that we have there, uh, the relationship between the energy as well as the relationship between the two vectors, we end up with the fact that the hole and, and uh, electron, missing electron, have identical velocities. All right. What else can we say about the hole? We can now try to describe what is the current carried by this one missing electron. The current is a sum of the charges times the velocity of the charge. And when we have a band which misses one electron, we essentially sum up over all electrons that are moving. But the sum over all velocities yields eventually a zero. So again, the sum over all velocities would be equal to zero because of the symmetry, at least in the free electron model, which leads to the fact that the sum over all velocities with the one missing electron leads to the minus VE. So then we do not have um, the cancellation of all vectors of all motion in one and the opposite direction, should be vectors here everywhere, but we end up with a net transport. Well, this is indeed the way how charge transfer is realized. We have an excited electron, an electron which enters the conduction band, and there this electron carries a charge. The charge is minus E. Now, when we put all of this together, we see that this is equal to the charge or the current carried by this nearly full band is equal to charge of an electron times VE, or actually minus charge of an electron times VE. VE from here we know is the same as VH, so the velocity of, an hole, of a hole. And we get therefore the current is equal to E as the um, unit charge times VH. So we get that it is the same uh, direction as the electrons were moving, however, of an opposite charge. So from here, we get the property of a hole as a positively charged quasi-particle in our system. And finally, in the analogy of the effective mass of an electron, we can define also an effective mass of a hole using exactly the same formula. And from this second derivative, we now obtain that the holes are negatively, uh, uh, are, are the effective mass of a hole is opposite sign the uh, effective mass of the missing electron. So whenever I would have an effective mass of an electron, with negative values, I can describe this by holes, which then end up as quasi-particles with positive mass, is something that I can handle intuitively, that move in the same direction as the uh, missing electron, but contains, instead of negative charge, contains positive charge. What is very important with these holes is that now they allow for explaining the positive values of the whole constant. 
if you remember what we did in the Druder model and well, in Sommerfeld model, we didn't really discuss the whole effect. So in the Druder model, we ended up saying that the uh, qualitative description of the phenomenon is now available. But unlike in experiment, we end up with having the whole constant always negative. And in experiment, you would sometimes measure that the whole constant, which measures the ratio or the, uh, the diffraction of the ratio between the transverse, uh, transverse uh, electric field and the direct electric field and the applied magnetic field. Uh, that this can be an experiment sometimes positive. Now we know why this would be the case, because we would have the carrier that carries the charge would be only a few electrons from almost a full band, which we can describe as a positively charged holes that have as I said, the same charge, but opposite sign as an electron, the same velocities. So that means that the Lorentz force acting on such particle is opposite and therefore also the um, accumulation of the charges on the opposite side then would be for electrons. Good, this brings me to the end of this first part where we have made a couple of uh, notes on the band structure. We specifically spoke about the similarities between tight binding and nearly free electrons model. The similarities stem from the fact that uh, for these the lowest energy bands and so on, we could show that both methods yield qualitatively the same or similar topology of the band structure leading to extrema at the gamma point and the Brillouin zone boundaries. They also are fairly well approximated by parabolic dispersion relationships near to this extrema. And this uh, parabolic approximation of the bands is extremely useful when we start uh, discussing the properties of uh, an electron, when we try to make the analogy with classical properties such as mass, such as second Newton's law, in which we defined the, uh, or we first derived the force acting on an electron as a time derivative of the k vector. So the relationship between the force and the time derivative of the k vector, the state of an, uh, of an electron. And then we define the effective mass of an electron using the uh, curvature or being proportional to the inverse curvature of the band. Therefore, when we are able to say that near to the extrema of the band structure, these bands can be fairly well approximated by parabolas. It means the effective mass of an electron is constant near to the band extrema. And in this last part, now we have defined holes, uh, quasi particles, with the idea that instead of describing a full band of electrons, it is easier and convenient to describe what is missing with respect to a full and uh, full band which uh, properties are known. So full band would be uh, described by having, for example, the sum over all k vectors uh, equal to zero, sum over all velocities equal to zero. And when we now take into consideration that there are only few electrons, we did it for one electron missing from this full band, we can describe it using a quasi-particles that have opposite charge than an electron. Each such a hole has an opposite K vector uh, with respect to the missing electron. It has the same velocity as a missing electron. And very importantly, it has an opposite effective mass. And all of these 
leads to the fact that using the holes, we can now obtain positive values for the whole constant. And we can explain the experimentally observed uh, results. <laughs>